a PWM controller that's not only based on transistors, but doesn't require any fancier components than transistors. Ever since I uploaded this video over 6 months ago, I wanted to simplify my PWM generator to make it run entirely on old-fashioned, simple transistors, instead of relying on some fancy, exotic MOSFET to generate a clean square wave. Well, now the mystery has been solved, although unfortunately not by me. I mean, I also solved it, but a relatively new channel called Breadboard Circuits by Steve Morrison did a much better job at it. So in this video I want to show you my approach of it and then explain why Steve's way of doing it works so much better when compared on the oscilloscope, plus in the end we'll take the best of both designs to create one hopefully perfect PWM controller you can use on your projects. To begin with, I'm simply going to assume you already watched my first video on the subject, so if you have no idea what I'm talking about or why this doesn't even look like a PWM controller, you might want to watch it first. Fuck it. Or why this dropped... Oh, it's still working. To begin with, I'm simply going to assume you already watched my first video on the subject, so if you have no idea what I'm even talking about or why this doesn't look like a PWM controller at all, you might want to watch that first for some context. The design I first came up with uses a simple A-stable multivibrator to generate a base frequency with a potentiometer here to allow us to change the duty cycle of either of these transistors, and then we simply have a MOSFET over here connected to the collector of the right transistor, taking the signal to switch our load, be it a motor or a lamp or whatever. Now of course the signal is inverted in the process, meaning the MOSFET only turns on when this transistor is off, incidentally pairing the load with the left transistor instead of the right one, but that doesn't actually matter because the multivibrator is equal on both sides anyway, so effectively it really only changes the direction you need to turn the potentiometer to increase the duty cycle. Now as you can tell this works perfectly fine even for other purposes than making noise, however, as soon as you try to substitute the MOSFET for a transistor, problems start to arise. But why would I even want to swap the MOSFET for a transistor, I hear you ask? Well, for all those of you who don't know yet, I love building stuff out of trash, and decent sized MOSFETs are just so much rarer in consumer electronics than transistors, that it would just be the natural evolution of the circuit to swap them out. As much as I'd love to explain every single detail of how this circuit works and why it does what it does, it is way too complex to explain in a single video, aside from the fact that I myself still haven't quite managed to wrap my head around some of the root causes for the issue, so for now we're just gonna concentrate on the problem itself and how to solve it, and even before that we need to make sure we're on the same page, which brings me to why this pulse width modulation just looks like a few blinking LEDs. Usually to look at things like PWM and stuff you'd use an oscilloscope, but since this is an A-stable multivibrator, the oscillating frequency of which is determined by the value of these two capacitors, we can simply put in bigger value capacitors in order to slow it down far enough for us to see what's going on. And then if we just put an LED in line with each of these resistors and another one instead of the load over here, Voila, this is what you see here. On this one, incidentally, I also swapped out the potentiometer for two fixed value resistors to get a nice, precise, predetermined duty cycle. Long story short, for now we don't need an oscilloscope to see what's going on, as basically the only thing we're after is to get the load to light up simultaneously with one of the other LEDs, but unfortunately getting it to do just that is more difficult than expected. The problems we get can be separated into two categories, number one being that the AMV does not like getting current pulled out of, so if we just put a transistor where the MOSFET once was, like so, this is what happens. The multivibrator gets completely thrown off balance, and what was supposed to be a neat 50% duty cycle is now obviously lopsided. You see, if I pull out this transistor, that's what the multivibrator does on its own, but as soon as I turn the output back on, the oscillation is screwed. That's because the current flowing through this resistor, and incidentally also through this LED, is primarily meant to charge this capacitor, but if we start draining part of it away into an external component, this capacitor obviously takes longer to charge than the other one, which in turn makes the left LED linger. But before I move on to problem number two, I quickly need to ask you to give that subscribe button a little pet, 
because we're aiming for 22k subscribers in 2022 and as of right now it's still a very lofty goal we are absolutely not on track to make it so please if you enjoy my content consider subscribing and maybe leaving a little like anyway back to the video the oscillation becoming lopsided did not happen with the MOSFET because of problem number two, which is that MOSFETs and transistors are two fundamentally different components, whereas transistors need a constant supply of current to their base to stay switched on, MOSFETs only require a voltage to be present and no current will flow into their gate, thus making the presence of the MOSFET irrelevant to the AMV. So in order to make it work for transistors, we basically need to reduce the current we tap off the AMV as much as possible by increasing the value of this resistor to something like 100k or so, as well as using several transistors in a Darlington configuration to get a high enough current gain to actually be able to drive the load. And did it work? Well, unfortunately not. The load stayed on all the time, pulsing a little bit, while the multivibrator oscillated mostly undisturbed. I honestly have no idea why it didn't work at the time, because just now when I recreated the circuit, it worked flawlessly for some reason, so I actually had to sabotage it in order to show you guys what it really did. But anyway, at the time it did not work, which kind of discouraged me, so I put the entire circuit out of my mind for the time being, and moved on to other projects. Then, a few months ago, with the controller board for my DIY soldering station coming up, I finally gave another effort to solve this all-transistor PWM problem, because I really needed it to incorporate into my soldering station controller. I figured the only other difference between MOSFETs and transistors relevant in this case would be the threshold voltage, with the MOSFET switching on at around 4 volts, as opposed to the transistor, activating as early as 0.6 volts, so to emulate a higher threshold voltage for the transistor, I simply tried putting a Zener diode in series with a 100k resistor, and ta-da, it suddenly worked. As you can see, the load is in sync with the left LED, without destabilizing the AMV. Now, at this point I was quite happy about the simple fix, I incorporated the design into my soldering station controller, and when I published the video, a subscriber suggested I could also use a resistive voltage divider to mimic the higher threshold voltage. I must admit, I was kinda skeptical at first, but I tried it, and sure enough, it works just as well. With these two solutions on hand, it was finally time to start thinking about doing the video you're watching right now, so I started SEO optimizing video title ideas. Yes, my video titles are only as dumb as they are because including nonsensical words or numbers in the video title actually helps find the video through the search bar. Anyway, while I was researching good video titles, I stumbled across a video which hadn't been there the first time, doing exactly what I was about to do. Making a PWM controller using only transistors. As you can probably imagine, I was less than delighted. After all, here on YouTube it's all about originality, and if somebody else had come up with a solution to the problem first, well, my video would be kinda pointless, wouldn't it? So, slightly annoyed and marginally interested in how he had solved the issue, I gave Steve's video a little watch. Turned out his design was pretty similar to mine after all, except he inverted the signal before use, synchronizing the load with the right LED, which, like I said before, is technically unnecessary, but nonetheless he got away without a Zener diode or similar rubbish. At first I thought, maybe I could move on as planned and just ignore Steve's video, after all it didn't have very many views and certainly wouldn't have posed a threat to mine, especially since mine would likely get more views right off the bat, but then I realized that would just be downright stupid. Maybe Steve's design was better after all, in which case I would literally be spreading misinformation. And I honestly don't want to descend to lifehack hell. So digging a little deeper, it turned out Steve had another video on his channel where he covered how to design the circuit, which, by the way, hats off, nowadays there ain't many people explaining stuff in detail anymore, but his explanations made sense and really got me doubting the brilliance of what I had come up with. You see, I'm not a pro in electronics, I started out just over 10 years ago and haven't really gotten past analog circuitry yet, but nonetheless I cracked out the oscilloscope, or rather just an Arduino with a little sketch to plot some voltages over time, and started comparing my design to Steve's. 
Well, long story short, or actually end of the story altogether, Steve's design was definitely superior. Let me try to explain why. The thing is, an A-stable multivibrator, because it relies on charging and discharging capacitors to flip back and forth, doesn't generate a perfect square wave on its own, so if we were to draw the switching curve for one of these transistors, it looks something like this. At first, it turns on in a steep incline, almost but not quite vertical, then it stays on for a while until the capacitor discharges, at which point it plummets down again and trails off into kind of an exponential curve, where it remains for a while until the cycle repeats. This exponential bit down here is because there is some residual voltage left in the capacitor, the transistor never really manages to shut off decisively. Now keep in mind this is just the transistor switching curve, I drew that first because the thing you'll see on the oscilloscope once you start probing this point will be a lot less intuitive. It's the voltage we can measure, our actual signal, it'll automatically be the exact negative of the transistor switching curve kind of just because of the way the circuit is constructed. So here's my makeshift oscilloscope, basically just some code I downloaded running on the Arduino, plotting the voltages measured on the analog input pins to the serial plotter in the IDE. It only goes up to like 1 kilohertz, but since we slowed down the AMV, it's more than good enough. Now if I connect the probe, you'll see the waveform that shows up, wait for it, wait for it, is exactly what I showed you on the paper. And that's where we get to the meat of the problem. Since this is the voltage of the signal we feed into our MOSFET, or in this case transistor, if I show you an exaggerated version of the graph you'll quickly notice it. Down here we have 0 volts or ground, and up here let's say is 12 volts, but our MOSFET's gate threshold voltage was around 4 volts. So effectively it'll only start conducting once the voltage passes the 4 volt mark, which is right here, just below the middle of the slope. And likewise, on the other side, the MOSFET turns off just a bit early. Now you might say, but Benjamin, why is that even a problem? The rise and fall portion amounts to only a tiny section of the waveform, surely this millisecond won't compromise functionality of the final circuit. And besides, it worked perfectly fine with the MOSFET as it is. Well, you are right, it works, and it doesn't matter to functionality so to speak. But let's measure the waveform. The circuit is locked in at 50% unicycle via these resistors replacing the potentiometer and I measure the capacitors to make sure they are the same value because electrolytic capacitors tend to deviate a lot. So now let's stop sampling and measure this the old fashioned way. So for the time the voltage is low I get 79 millimeters, and up here unfortunately I can't measure because there's no defined corners, so instead let's go from this point to this point, and that's exactly 79 as well. This means if we have the same time interval from here to here as we have from this point to this point, in order to get an exact 50% duty cycle, we obviously need the load to be on over the entirety of the pulse, not just this portion here where the MOSFET actually switches on. Otherwise we just get a lean duty cycle, and making the transistor mimic a MOSFET by adding a 3 volt Zener diode or a voltage divider to artificially raise the threshold voltage naturally changes nothing about that. If anything it makes things even worse because now we're not only switching poorly, but also draining current out of the AMV, destabilizing it further. By the way, this number here I totally made it up. In reality, it'll be much closer to 50%. I just exaggerated to get my point across. But anyway, now you know what my design leaves to be desired. How does Steve's version perform in this regard? Actually, a lot better, ironically owing to the fact that he inverted the output. You see, by putting the first transistor of the output stage down here, like Steve did, the base threshold voltage will be only 0.7 volts in respect to ground, as opposed to the 4 volts of my MOSFET, so on this waveform the transistor turns on pretty darn near instantly, creating a square wave much closer to the true duty cycle. It's still not perfect, but as close as you can possibly get. 
So yes, I'm nitpicking. We're talking about improvements in the range of microseconds for a standard 15 kHz PWM signal, and although I can't think of any application that would need this kind of precision pulse width modulation, if things can be improved, they must be improved, just for the sake of it. Now there's one last variant of the circuit I want to discuss before moving on to combine Steve's and my design into one almighty PWM controller. Earlier I mentioned that while preparing for this video, for some reason the circuit suddenly also worked perfectly fine without the Zener diode nor the voltage divider, just on its own like here. See there's no Zener diode in here and yet it works. So here is why this version still performs worse than Steve's design. Generally, if you have several transistors and you stack them up in a Darlington configuration, since every one of them has its own 0.7V base emitter voltage, these just stack up to give us a higher total threshold voltage of, in this case, 2.1V, whereas if the first transistor is tied to ground, it'll only ever be 0.7V, no matter how many transistors you stack up beyond this point. That's all there is to the problem. Now we have Steve's design as well as mine. Let's get all this crap out of the way and put the two together. Because even though Steve's design is good, there are still things that can be improved. We're gonna start off with the standard A-stable multivibrator shell. Just a couple of resistors and transistors loosely strewn about. Now, for the potentiometer, this is where things start to diverge already, whereas Steve used two resistors down here and put the potentiometer on top, I actually put the resistor up top and the potentiometer down here, and what I think is an issue with Steve's design is that it never goes down all the way to 0% duty cycle, nor all the way up to 100 it always sticks somewhere in between, so we're definitely gonna go with my version here and just put the potentiometer here. And now to the first transistor of the output stage. We're gonna go with Steve's placement of the transistor. So here we have the 100k resistor and then the first transistor here, tied to ground with another resistor up here. Then we get to the second transistor, and I'm going to put that like so. Another resistor, and then finally the power transistor. Um, it's gonna be a lot bigger, just the way I draw things. And now our load, it will be a motor like usual. The reverse voltage protection diode, I'm going to put it here. And now this just feeds into the base of the power transistor. Now one thing I'm going to add to make things better is that I noticed even with a 100k resistor here, the circuit is still a tiny little bit biased towards the left side. So the easiest way to change that is by simply drawing the same amount of current we draw out of the right side out of the left side as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and put another 100k resistor here. And to replace the junction of this transistor, we can simply go ahead and put a tiny little diode down here. Just use the lowest current diode you can find. Anything is going to work. It's just to get this 0.7 volt threshold voltage here as well. And the resistor is going to do the rest. So this is everything for the circuit. Now I'm going to go ahead and calculate all the resistor values and since this is going to take a while, I'm gonna cut it off here and catch you later. But I'm going to publish the full clip on my second channel, so if you want to watch that, link will be in the video description. Here we go, all the component values are inserted. In most cases you have quite a bit of leeway in terms of the exact resistor values you can use. And likewise, the transistors are pretty unconstrained as well, so you can really play around with it a lot. But other than that, this is Steve's Chronic PWM. By the way, Steve, if you're watching, sorry for giving it this stupid name. I know it sounds like an illness, which shouldn't be joked about, but it was just too tempting. And of course, I put it together on the breadboard to see if it actually works, which I think you should judge for yourself. In terms of specifications, this is designed for 12 volts at up to 1 amp. 
If you need higher current capability, you can simply extend this Starlinking array with increasingly beefier transistors until you get to the current desired. However, I would advise you if you need to switch something like 5 amps and above, just go with a MOSFET. In this case, transistors simply aren't worth it. You'll be draining loads of current just to get this huge transistor to turn on. So in the long run, if you need to control big motors and stuff, you'll definitely be better off with a MOSFET. I'm going to link schematics for several versions of this circuit down in the video description. This exact one, another one for 5 volts, and an improved one using a MOSFET, so you can download those as you please. Definitely go check out Steve's channel, as he does all kinds of intriguing analog circuitry and stuff, like the channel name implies, so if that's something you're interested in, definitely go subscribe to him as well. Also, like I mentioned, the video where I figure out the component values for this thing is on my second channel, although, spoiler alert, Steve did a better job at explaining things, so you might go and watch his video instead. No, watch it after mine, not instead. Anyway, even though I have to take the L on that one, I am so glad this mystery is now solved and there is in fact a way of generating PWM without using a MOSFET. It would have been such a shame to use a MOSFET on every dimmable desk light or other low power appliance. That's why I wanted to share this with you guys despite there being arguably not much interest in PWM controllers in general. I hope you enjoyed even though I admittedly went over the top with my explanations again. I'll hopefully get the soldering station done relatively soon. Oh, speaking of soldering station, I'm gonna have to take the Zener diode out of the circuit now that we know it doesn't improve things. I'll just replace it with a piece of wire, really. So, I'll be off to do that. Bye!